Amen? We ought to see chains released all over the floor right now. Amen? Because the chains are broken. How many of y'all are glad to be in the house of the Lord today? Amen? Amen. Well, it's good to see you all. So glad you guys are with us. This day the Lord has made, we can rejoice and be glad in it. Amen? Can I make a confession this morning? Um, so we had a funeral on, um, I think it was Friday, I think it was. And uh, was it Friday? Uh, we had a funeral last week. And so um, I keep my preaching Bible up here. And so I ended up taking my preaching Bible home. And so I came out this morning. Well, I, I left that Bible at the house. And so I grabbed another Bible off my shelf. And it was a different version. And so I was reading it. I felt like, this ain't the Bible. Uh, 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 so, I'm, so, <laughs> so I'm reading from my phone this second service. Um, anyway, I'm glad to see you guys. Glad you guys are here. So excited that you guys came to hear the Word of God. We are here to encourage you, empower you, inspire you in God's Word. Amen? And to help you think from a kingdom perspective, to think biblically, and to think the way God wants you to think. So we want to see you guys grow and mature and be all you can be in Jesus Christ. So we got another installment on today. I was watching CNN. You know, I do my devotions on CNN and ESPN. And so I was doing devotion on CNN, and I saw this video. And I said, you know what, that's a great opening to my sermon today. So you all are going to see a video. It's a real life video. It's not a Christian video. It's, 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 it's just a video. But it has great application to our sermon today. So they're going to play that video right now, and then I'll get started with the sermon. A brave man in Beijing rescued this family stranded on a rooftop as waters raged on the streets below. The man driving a front loader carried two adults and a child to safety following heavy rains from Typhoon Doksori. At least 21 people died in China after the storm, and 12 people are still missing in the country's capital. The typhoon pummeled Beijing with the heaviest rainfall the city has seen since records began 140 years ago. Amen. Father, we come to you right now, God. We do thank you and praise you, Lord, for your goodness, your grace, and your mercy, Father. And God, as we saw in that video, God, that was um, somebody, God, who stepped outside their comfort zone to go and help somebody else. I want to pray today, God, that we step outside of our comfort zone and go and help other people who are in need. It's in Jesus' name, I ask it all. Amen. As you all can see with that tractor, if you watch that tractor closely, that, that tractor had got into a major flood. And there was a major flood and waters were coming and it was a really dangerous situation. And so if you watch that tractor, when the tractor was coming back after it had retrieved the people, it was going um, consistent with the tide. But in going against the people and going to get the people, it was going against the tide. And how many of you all know that we need to be like that guy in that tractor? We need to spiritually and figuratively take our own resources, take it by our own initiative to put ourselves in danger to go and help other people who are in spiritual danger. Our pastor today talks about the kingdom of God, and it talks about this grand banquet, this grand invitation, and it's basically about us going out and inviting people to come to this grand banquet that God is inviting people to be part of his kingdom. The challenge is, though, is that we're not kingdom-centric people. The challenge is that, boy, we're talking about earth, but not the kingdom of God. We're so focused on life here on earth that we really don't think about life when we get to heaven and we go to glory. The question becomes, why does God put us here? God doesn't leave us here because God needs what we have. God don't need our house, he don't need our car, he don't need our intellect, he don't need our contribution. The earth is the Lord's, the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. And so God really doesn't need anything from us. And so we're not adding value. God's portfolio is not increasing because we're here on earth. God is transcendent and God exists outside of creation and God's value is not tied to his creation. So since God exists outside of creation and his value is not tied to creation, the question becomes, why does God need us in creation? And so God uses us in creation because God wants to grow us closer to him. God wants us to voluntarily trust him and walk with him. God wants to give us an opportunity to enjoy the life that he gives to us but then God also wants us to be connectors of other people who don't know him. But the challenge is, is that God don't grade us every day. And God doesn't come back and give us an evaluation every day. So we're not really sure how we're doing it. We're not really cognizant of how we ought to function. 
today I want to suggest it's time for us to go. You know, when it comes to church, we talk about, well, well who's coming to church and how many people that you have at church today? The real question becomes not if the church is, uh, people are coming to church. The question becomes, is the church going to get people? And so I want to show that, boy, it's time for us to go. It's time for us to stop waiting. It's time for us to stop waiting for people to show up. It's time to get busy sharing the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen? Like in that video, there were some people who were stranded. There were some people who were in danger. There were some people who didn't know how they were going to survive. But there was one person, not two people, not three people, not ten people. There was one person who took the initiative to use his resources to go against the tide and go and help somebody else. So in our culture today, it's politically incorrect to talk about your faith. It's politically incorrect to talk about, are you going to heaven or are you going to hell? But the question is not if it's politically correct. The question becomes, is it spiritually correct? Do you want to be politically correct or do you want to be spiritually correct? Do you want the approval of man or do you want the approval of God? Now, boy, here's the misnomer. The misnomer or the miscalculation is that, is that life down here is more important than life up there. But the reality is you're going to spend 70, the average length of time of life now is 78 years, I believe, for men. And I think it's 82 for women. Y'all ain't got as much stress. Ha! Smile at me already. So watch this now. Um, whether it's 78 years or it's 82 years, it's, it's, a, it's a small comparison to eternity. But the problem is we highlight time more than we highlight eternity, and we spend more time preparing for life rather than preparing for eternal life. Are we tracking together? And so what happens is we're, we're, we're concerned about being rewarded here on earth rather than our rewards we will receive in heaven. 1 Corinthians 3 talks about as believers, we're going to receive rewards in heaven. What Satan does is Satan knows that once we get saved, he can't stop us from going to heaven. But what he tries to do is diminish the level of our rewards once we get to heaven. So when we get to heaven, it's not just going to be one big room of kids playing together. Okay, it's going to be different levels of enjoyment of heaven based upon your work and your service to God. But what happens is we don't talk about that. We don't teach about that. And boy, the Bible about wood, hay, and stubble, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Whatever is wood, hay, or stubble, it will be burned up. But the other things of precious metal, those things will endure the judgment of God. So when it comes to your works, are they wood, hay, or stubble, or are they precious metals that can endure the judgment of God? Are we tracking together? One of the things God wants us to do is that God wants us to be blessed, and one of the ways to be blessed is being involved in inviting people to God's banquet. And so there are people who are in spiritual danger who need our help. Turn to Luke chapter 14, if you have your Bibles with you, please. It's our privilege and responsibility to try to reach as many people as we can, even if it means swimming upstream. God wants you and I to be active every day to reach people for the cause of Jesus Christ. I jokingly mess with some people because the Great Commission, uh, the Great Commission is not evangelism, the Great Commission is discipleship. Matthew 28 says, Go ye therefore into all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded unto you. People see that term go first, they assume that go is the primary function of that passage. Go is actually a participle. It precedes the main verb. The main verb is make disciples. Then you've got going, baptizing, and teaching will work, work in conjunction with the main verb. Whew. Got the school stuff out the way, right? All right. There we go, right? So watch this now. The main verb is make disciples. So the great commission is to make disciples, not evangelism. So um, evangelism is the first step in discipleship. And so watch this now. Um, it takes on, it's a, um, what the scholars call attendant circumstance. Attendant circumstance in the grammar says that, that, that the participles connected with that main verb take on the force of the main verb. The main verb is in the imperative. It's a command. So if make disciples is a command, that means evangelize, baptizing, and teaching are also commands. And so us going out to be a witness and sharing our faith with people, that's not an option. It's a command. So it should not be as you go. It's let's go. 
that, let, let's get busy. Let's get ready to rumble. Let's go share our faith. It's not as you go, if you go, if you decide to go, it's not at your convenience. It's a command. Are we tracking together? And so this whole idea of going and sharing our faith is a command from God. God commands us to go and share our faith. Here's my thesis today. It's time to turn apathy into urgency. As the body of Christ, we become apathetic when it comes to sharing our faith. I mean, church has become about with them. What's in it for me? You know, what can the church do for me? Can the church heal me? Can the church help me? Can the church help me get better? Can the church help my family? And you know, um, all that stuff is appropriate in context, but the problem is when that becomes the main thing instead of the secondary peripheral thing, it becomes a problem. Are we tracking together? And so what happens is it becomes idolatry when it becomes the main thing. So what you see in Luke chapter 14, he talks to us about turning our apathy into urgency. He's talking to the Pharisees, having a comment with these Pharisees, and now he comes with this, with this parable, this story about the thing called a banquet. He gives us five words to turn apathy into urgency. In other words, one of the things that hit the church um, even before COVID was this thing called apathy. We just don't care. We just don't care. Say, I don't care. How come you don't care? Smile at me. Yeah. <laughs> we just don't care. And, but we care more about where people get their hair done than folks going to eternity. We care more about our vacation spots than we care about where a person's going to spend eternity. We care more about somebody's job or their income and the neighborhood they live in rather than where a person's going to spend eternity. As kingdom people, one of our privileges is to invite other people to come into God's kingdom. You're going to enjoy God's kingdom now and in the future to the degree you understand and unleash the principles of God's kingdom. Amen? So this whole, this whole idea of apathy, COVID didn't help because COVID gave us a cover, didn't it? So what we do, but we, we go online, we go to the program, we turn it on, we put our phone down, and then we finish our nap. <laughs> Anybody wake up when the program was going off? All right. <laughs> I thought I was watching the program, right? <laughs> I mean, I did it myself, right? I mean, I don't like watching TV. I mean, watching church online, right? And so watch this now. We, we basically got two years off, and we figured, you know what? I don't have to go to church. I don't have to be connected with God. And my life's still going to be okay, even though I'm not real intense with God after two years. And so now you're trying to tell me it's important to be intense with God. Well, you know what? After two years of not watching it, not attending, not serving, not meeting up with people, not doing small work, I'm okay. My life is fine. But I'm trying to tell you what I need. This Why do I need this? The question is, what is the quality of your life? And the question is, are you being used for God's purposes? God is not going to judge you because he showed you grace. God is not going to judge you because you're enjoying the privileges that he gave to you. If only do it. We all have more than what we deserve. Amen? Amen? So watch this now. Are we fulfilling God's purposes of being great commissioned people, making disciples, first step, sharing the gospel? So we come into this, um, 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 to this parable, the great banquet, and he gives us a story to help illustrate what our priorities ought to be. He shows the various responses of people to the invitation of God to come be a part of his kingdom. Now, this kingdom thing is interesting because when it comes to kingdom, the question becomes, what is the kingdom of God? Is the kingdom of God present now or is the kingdom of God future? And then, boy, how do I live out the kingdom of God? So the kingdom of God is both present and it's also future. The um, um, kingdom of God is both personal and it's also communal and it's also spiritual. In this passage, the kingdom of God is primarily being referred to from a future vantage point. Are we tracking together? So it's not contradictory, it's complementary. In this passage, you see a kingdom invitation, you see kingdom expectation, you see kingdom celebration, you see kingdom rejection, you see kingdom resignation, you see kingdom perspiration, and then you see a kingdom presentation. I thought y'all enjoyed the Bible. Smile at me, all right? Luke 14, verse 12, these words are found. He said also to the man who had invited him, when you give a dinner or a banquet, watch this now, 
Do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or your rich neighbors. And so what he does is, you know, okay, guys, here's this big banquet. Here's this big gathering. Here's this big party. I want you to have two lists. I want you to have a do not invite list. And then I want you to have an invite list. Now, we already got these two lists, don't we? It's some people on your do not invite list. Last time I talked to her, she got on my last nerve. She on the do not invite list, all right? I loaned them some money. They didn't give it back. It would be uncomfortable if they come. They on the do not invite list, all right? They always start an argument. They on the do not invite list, all right? Then you got your invite list. It's the people you like, the people you hang out with, the people who you got chemistry with. God flips it on his head. You know what? I want you to invert your do not invite list with your invite list. He says, watch this now. I want you on your do not invite list, I want you not to invite your friends, your brothers, your relatives, or your rich neighbors. Now, these are the people who we, who we spontaneously invite. Then he says, here's why I don't want you to invite them. He says, lest they also invite you in return and you be repaid. Human instinct is to, is to do stuff for people who can do stuff for you. You wash my back, I'll wash your back. We're going to Kenya to serve kids in Kenya because they can't do anything for us. At our church, we have these things called six D's at our church. The first D is decide on Christ for the church. The second D is discover the awesomeness of God in worship. The third D is devote yourself to spiritual disciplines and a life group of people. The fourth D is deploy your spiritual gifts. The fifth D is develop and start leading people. The sixth D, which we call success, is you dispatch yourself beyond these four walls based upon the gifts that God has given you to expand the kingdom of God by serving people who can't do anything in return for you. Are we tracking together? See, guys, our cultural instinct is to do stuff for people who can do stuff for you. The Sermon on the Mount teaches what, 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 what benefit do you have when you love those who love you? The benefit, you know what? I'm loving people who are unlovable. I'm loving people who don't love me. I'm being generous to those who aren't generous to me. I'm giving to people who are disenfranchised, downcast, and can't give anything back to me. See, guys, you don't get credit when you take your boss a gift. You know what? You know what? At the end of the day, my boss is going to be evaluating me. And when they evaluate me for my income and for my promotion and for my, and for my, um, my um, cola, I was going to feel real. In fact, here go two gifts, boss. You know, I'm, I'm bringing you coffee. I'm bringing you a gift card, all that kind of stuff. Now, watch this now. It, there's no problem with being polite. There's no problem with being courteous. But at the same time, God says, I want you to have an inverted invite list and then your do not invite list. So who's on the invite list then? See, the first thing God wants you to do is, um, is, is practice generosity. Give to someone who can't give back to you. He says, don't invite your friends, don't invite your brothers, don't invite your relatives or rich neighbors, lest they also invite you in return and be paid. You get no points in heaven when you get your points on earth. Verse 13, but when you give a feast, invite the poor, invite the cripple, invite the lame, and invite the blind. Now watch this now. This is the whole idea of inviting people to come and be a part of the kingdom of God. We've been conditioned not to invite people to become part of God's kingdom because we already assume they've heard the message. Number two, you know what? I don't want to be politically incorrect, so I'm not going to invite somebody because I don't want people on earth mad at me by default I'm, I'd rather God in heaven be mad at me. See, but when you give a feast, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame. Blind. Well, boy, who do the poor, um, um, the crippled, the lame, and the blind uh, represent? Some of y'all say, everybody I know already. <laughs> They're my friends right there, right? Watch this now. Um, these represent people who are, who are overlooked, underrepresented, and underestimated. These are people who are often overlooked, underestimated, and people who people don't pay attention to because they don't per se have earthly influence. But don't confuse earthly influence with heavenly influence. See, many of our ancestors, they didn't have much. 
but they built institutions. They got this. They got kids through college, and but, but boy, they had no college. They built families. They built homes. They built communities. Their word mattered in the community. Now, we got money. We got, we got, we got degrees, but we ain't got no influence. Are we tracking together? So, boy, don't confuse because you have stuff mean you have influence. He said, I want you to go to people who are, who are often overlooked, under, underestimated, and, um, and, and boy, those who are disenfranchised. I want them to be on your invite list. So, number one, he says, generosity. I want you to give to someone who can't give back to you. I want you to go and target people who are receptive to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Number two, he used the word called expectancy. This is what I mean, expectancy. Watch this now. Be blessed because you were a blessing. Be blessed because you were a blessing. How many of you all want to be blessed? I mean, everybody in their right mind want to be blessed, right? I mean, I want to be blessed. Am I coming? Am I going? Am I rising? Am I, I want to be blessed. The question becomes, am I committed to the means of being blessed? He says here in verse, in verse, in verse 14, these words are found. And you will be blessed because they cannot repay you. You are blessed when you treat people well who are overlooked, underestimated, disenfranchised. When you serve them well, then you are already blessed. You're blessed because you gave to people who can't give anything back to you. Now, what's interesting here, he didn't say that they responded. He didn't say that, boy, they trusted Christ. He just said, because you did what you were supposed to do, then you're blessed because you took responsibility, not because of their response. And see, in our cautious side of it, we're so concerned about results and response that if we don't anticipate a good result or a good response, then we abnegate our responsibility. See, sharing the gospel is not primarily about who responds. Because, see, boy, the response comes down to what God is doing, what God's Spirit is doing, um, um, spiritual warfare, the receptivity of their heart. That's got nothing to do with you being obedient. Has your kid ever said to you, well, can I go so and so and so and so and You say, no, you can't go. And they say, well, Johnny, mama, oh, 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 oh. start right there. I ain't Johnny's mama. I ain't Johnny's dad. You don't live in Johnny's house. You live in my house. And because you belong to me, you're going to do what I want you to do because you belong to me. Now, if you move to Johnny's house, then Johnny Mama can tell you what to do. But until you move to Johnny's house, you can't do what Johnny does. God says, because you're a child of mine, it doesn't matter what everybody else does. You've got to follow what I ask you to do because you're my child. You're under my covering. You're experiencing my provision, my empowerment, my love, my concern, my care. I'll be tracking together. And so, and so, and so, he said, you know what? Expectancy. We want to be blessed. Watch this now. You're blessed when you give to somebody who can't give anything else in return for you or to you. It's not, you know what, I'm going to give because I want them to be a blessing. No, I'm going to give because I just, just want to be generous. I'm going to invite them because I want to see them in eternity. He goes on here in verse 14. He says, um, he says, and you will be blessed. And so there's no question um, about it. You'll be blessed when you're a blessing to somebody else. Why? Because they cannot repay you. For you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. He says, watch this now. You don't get every, every day is not payday for the believer. See, boy, you know, boy, you ever see folks, you know what, they, they come in the house, they do something, they want to get paid right now. I mean, but pay me, in fact, boy, pay me early, all right? Pay me early. Don't pay when I get done. Pay me early, all right? With God, you don't just get paid at the end of the tags. You get paid at the end of the era. Amen. If you get everything now, be concerned. There are some things in God that are future. And the challenging part about serving God is that God don't pay you every day. The same way many of you all's job make, you're not day laborers, okay? You don't get paid at the end of the day. You get paid on that day. You get paid at the, at the, at the judgment seat. You get paid when God is issuing out rewards to believers. You get paid when, you know what, this is the end of time. Now I'm rewarding in full 
all those who serve me, all those who sacrifice for me, all those who walk with me, now you get paid. And so he says, see the terminology of the resurrection of the just. He says, you're going to get paid. Don't worry. You're going to get paid. It's just not today. Verse 15. When one of those who reclined at the table with him heard these things, he said to him, Blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. So watch this now. Everybody who's part of the kingdom of God will be blessed. How do you turn apathy into urgency? Number one is to practice generosity. Number two is to have e e expectancy. Number three is to overcome apathy. We mentioned the earlier day in our sermon talked about apathy, how we live in an apathetic culture and society. So but he gives this image and he said, um, blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. But he said to him, a man once gave a great banquet and invited many. And, um, and um, at, at the time for the banquet, he sent his servant to say to those who had been invited, come for everything is now ready. So it's kind of like, you know, boy, you having this, um, you having your Christmas shindig, you having your Thanksgiving gathering for all your family. And boy, it's, I mean, this ain't no regular dinner, but you bring out the good stuff, don't you? You bring out dishes your kids can't even look at. All right, you bring out glass that came out. Boy, go downstairs in the basement and boy, find, a, find, a, find that heavy silver one. We ain't even no plan, but we're going to eat off the good stuff, boy. Go get the serving platters today, all righty? So, boy, I mean, this is a, this is a, this is a big banquet. This, this is a major banquet. He said, boy, he said to him, um, a man once gave a great banquet and invited many. And um, at the time of the banquet, he sent his servant. He said, boy, go tell everybody dinner ready. Go tell everybody it's time to come. To say to those who had been invited, come, for everything is now ready. Verse 18. But they all, not some, but they all alike began to make excuses. So watch this now. Imagine, boy, you're getting ready for Christmas dinner. And, boy, you know Christmas dinner, but, you know, it's something major going on. How you know something major going on? Because, boy, you got the kids cleaned up. And they say, you know what? Are we having company? Because, <laughs> boy, you don't clean that way all the time. <laughs> <laughs> but you got you got daily cleaning, then you got company cleaning, right? You know, boy, boy, you know, boy, when it's company cleaning, boy, you you all up under the stove, cleaning stuff off and everything, all right? If it's just daily cleaning, boy, you kicking stuff around, but you kinda just boy, I can move that later, but you kinda rearranging stuff, right? Okay, boy, you done seen that before, it's fine, right? But boy, boy, but boy, when company coming back, boy, pick that up, boy, and boy, wipe off the back of that stove, and boy, wipe them chandeliers off all the kinds of boy, because it's company coming, right? And boy, when it's company coming, you don't buy the cheap butter. <laughs> you get the real butter, right? Boy, you get everybody. Okay, boy, we got the great value green beans for the daily stuff. I need you to get some um, lipids. Come on, come on, come on. We got, we got company coming by today, all righty. All right, so boy, 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 we're going to get some good stuff today, right? He said, boy, go tell everybody we done prepared, we done got ready, we done got, boy, we, we have cleaned the house, we got, we got some good quality meat, we got some good vegetables, we didn't go get no shortening, we got the real butter. And go tell them dinner's ready. And he comes down here, and he says, at the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to come, say to those who have been invited, come for everything is ready. But they all, like, began to make excuses. The first said, I can't come. And I have bought a field, and I must go out and see it. Please have me excused. Another said, I bought five yoke of oxen. I go to examine them. Please have me excused. Another said, you know what, well, here, here's the best one. I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. Imagine going through all this stuff and going through all this trouble. When somebody calls and say, I ain't going to make it. What you mean you ain't going to make it? I done went and got the best green beans. I done got some good butter. I done cleaned the house up. I done took a bath and put some clean clothes on. <laughs> and you telling me you ain't coming? No, I ain't coming. Please excuse my absence. Okay, but no, boy, you're, 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 you're fine. Okay, okay, we excuse you. Hang the phone up. I ain't going to never. They just moved. I just moved them to the do not invite list, right? So <laughs> they made excuses. So watch this now. There was a major invitation. That was the great banquet. It wasn't a small banquet. It was a great banquet. Then there was a major rejection. They made excuses not to come. They had three excuses. Number one, I'm taking care of business. Number two, I'm taking care of my inventory and my investment. And number three, I'm taking care of my family. 
And so what happened was they became apathetic because they had misplaced priorities. They allowed other priorities to take precedence over God's invitation. So guys, as we're sharing with people and talking to people, we want to help people have proper priorities. Are you focused just merely on time or are you focused merely on eternity? The church has a problem here as well because what happens is we recognize that people have different priorities that are not kingdom priorities. So what we do is we try to, we try to acquiesce to the non-kingdom priorities and try wooing people to come to what? We're going to lower the standard. We're going to condescend. We're going to give up God's priorities in hopes that you will make God a priority. Not recognizing that what we just did was acquiesce to God's priorities and we just acquiesce to who God is and what God wants. And so we gave up God's agenda. So that's not what God is asking for. And so what happens now is when it comes to church, okay, but what can church do for me? Church ain't primarily about what can the church do for you. Church is primarily what can you do for God? How can you go out and build God's kingdom? How can you invite people to God's um, 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 great banquet? How can you help people have God's perspective where they can have greater results? Watch this now. I said, well, I don't want to do that because people are not responding. We must make decisions based on responsibility, not response. I will. We must make decisions based on responsibility, not response. We do what God wants us to do, irrespective of how other folks' response. But we have acquiesced because you know what? They're not going to respond properly, so I'm not going to take my responsibility. I'm not going to share the gospel because folks already know the gospel and they're going to reject the gospel. One of the good things about going to Kenya is you figure out they don't celebrate the people you celebrate. They don't venerate the people you venerate. The people who are stars for you don't mean nothing to them. So but you start spitting out names, but what about some of them? Who, is, who, who, who are you talking about? Their value system is different. Their educational system is different. How they function is different. Their pay scale is different. They even drive on the opposite side of the road. Are we tracking together? But what happens is we believe that our exposure is full and complete and that our value system is the same as other people's value system. And God is saying, you know what? There's so much more outside of you that, boy, you've got no clue is even happening. We'll come back to that. The first word from going from apathy to urgency is generosity. The second word is expectancy. The third word is apathy. The fourth word, I couldn't decide. It's either agony or angry. You decide which one you like best. Angry or apathy. Look at verse 21. So, boy, there was a great rejection. They made excuses. They went through all this cleaning, carpet cleaning, um, getting the windows clean. Some folks even put new, 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 new stuff in the, um, in the um, what you call that thing, in the flower bed because folks coming by. How did Jesus respond? Verse 21. So the servant came and reported these things to his master, Jesus the master. Then the master of the house became angry. Now stop right there. Some of y'all say, I ain't know Jesus got angry. Yeah, he got angry. It's not angry like we get angry. It's called righteous indignation. He got angry for the right reason. You say, well, Pastor, I, I was angry for the right reason too. It, it made me mad already. I, I got angry already. No, righteous indignation. You know what? I got angry because it violated the standards and the priority of God. When you watch the news, you ought to be ticked off. When you, when you, read, um, when you read the newspaper, you ought to be righteously angry. So the servant came and reported these things to his master. And the master of the house became angry and said to his servant, Go out quickly to the streets and lanes of the city and bring in the poor and crippled and blind and lame. And the servant said, Sir, what you have commanded has been done, and still there is room. In other words, we've gone out to the highways, the hedges, and the byways. We've called the poor. We've called the crippled. We've called the blind. But God, there's still room in your house. And the master said to the servant, Go out to the highways and hedges and compel people to come in that my house might be filled. So the first thing you see, boy, you see the Lord was angry because the invited guest did not respond or pull it to the invitation. We need to go even when people don't come immediately. We need to invite. So I, I say, guys, you know, let's go out to the same neighborhood, the same community. You might have missed a couple of how, but number two, when you present it the next time, a person might be in a different state of mind. See, the state of mind they was in the first time is a different state of mind to where they are right now. 
See, when you first get married, you don't want him, you know, about no premarital love, care. That's my boo. And I'm, and I'm in love. Give it about five weeks. <laughs> this might have been a boo-boo. Uh, um, where that counseling class at, boy? And boy, what, what was you saying before? Because, see, after you go through life and you get some bumps and some bruises, then, boy, the word doesn't change, but your state of mind changes. Here you go. Once you read through the Bible one time, you say, well, boy, I read everything. Why read it again? Because when you read through it again, you're going to be in a different place emotionally. You're going to be in a different place spiritually. You're going to be in a different place financially. You're going to be in a different place mentally. And so now when you read it, it's going to take on a whole different significance, not because the word has changed, but because you have changed. And now that you're going through it again, you're going to hear it differently. You're going to read it differently. You're going to talk about it differently. Are we tracking together? So watch this now. When you present the word to people again and you present the invitation again, you have no idea where they are. So at Christmas time, Mother's Day and Easter, say, well, go invite people again back to school. Go invite people again. Well, Pastor already invited them. They're in a different place now than they were last year this time. And you have no idea how they're going to respond. So you see his righteous indignation. When people had rejected, Jesus didn't move into inaction. He moved into action. So what did Jesus do when people rejected the gospel of Jesus Christ? You're reading the gospel. Saying, well, I, I want you all to go out two by two in these towns if they reject you. Shake the dust from your feet, but keep on moving. Too many of us have given up continuing the ministry of sharing the gospel because culture has generally rejected the gospel of Jesus Christ. I was in one of my Ph.D. classes, and somebody surfaced a book called Embracing Obscurity. In the book, Obscurity talks about how um, you're not as significant as you think you are. And that, boy, people don't know you as well as you think people know you. So, boy, when you go over to Kenya, you talk about, boy, all these NBA stars, all these NFL stars. They say, y'all call football by the wrong name. Football is with your foot, okay, not with your hand, right? And so, boy, they, they, you get millions of people who watch the real football, soccer, over people who watch somebody throwing the ball. They don't know all the NBA stars like we do. Just because you're a star, we don't mean you're a star over here because we have to embrace obscurity. So here's what happens. We think that everybody who needs to hear the gospel has heard the gospel. So, boy, there's a righteous indignation. Jesus' response was righteous initiation. Then there was also a righteous realization. Here it is. There are a lot more people to be reached than have been reached. We act as though everybody in the city has trusted Christ and responded to the gospel. There are plenty of people who have not heard the gospel right here in the Metroplex. Don't become overly concerned when a segment of people write you off, cast you off, and say, I'm done with you. You just tell them there's 8 billion more people in the world who I can go meet apart from you. Just because you stop calling me, just because you stop fraternizing, just because you stop I me, mean, it's a whole bunch of people. It's 8 million people in the Metroplex. You're going to get upset with 100? You're going to stop living because of 100? I was trying to get guys. There are so many people who are, who are stuck at the top of a house, and, and the floodwaters are coming through. Will you be that one in your tractor to pull up to them and help rescue them? And so he says, here, watch this now. Um, we have not exhausted the list of people who can become part of the kingdom of God. The first word to go from apathy to urgency is generosity. The second word is expectancy. The third word is apathy. The fourth word is agony or anger. You choose. The last one is urgency. Can you say urgency? He comes here now, boy, this is countercultural too. This is, this, is, this is against the tide. This is against the current. This is against the grain. He starts in verse 22 and he says this. And the servant said, Sir, what you commanded has been done, and still there is room. And the man said to the servant, Go out to the highways and hedges and compel people to come in, that my house may be full. For I tell you, none of those men who were invited shall taste my banquet. Well, who were those men? Those were the people who were initially invited, who had misplaced and misaligned priorities, who gave an excuse on why they couldn't do it. Jesus didn't say, Go keep begging them. Jesus said, watch this now, I want you to go and find other people. I want you to be intentional about finding other people. So in verse 21, he says, go quickly. Go quickly. See, boy, apathetic people wait to get, why? Well, I'll get to it when I get to it. <laughs> Urgent, well, I'm going to get to it right now. 
I want to get it done right now. All right. So there, there needs to be um, 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 a going quickly. Verse 21. Go, um, next, he says, go into the highways and the hedges. He wants us to go extensively. Why the highways and the hedges? He wants us to go find people to share this message with. See, it's not wait till they come to church, not wait till you run across them on the elevator. It's not as you go. It's go. Go look for them. Go find somebody. Go find somebody who does not know Jesus Christ and share the gospel with them. I don't know the guy who was an attractor, but I, I got a strong feeling that, boy, he didn't wait for somebody to tell him to go pick up those two people. He took the initiative. And, boy, he went, he went, he went to an awkward place to go find people who were in need of help. Go purposefully. Verse 23. And the master to the servant, go out to the highways and the hedges and compel people to come. He used the word here. He says, compel people to come in. <laughs> compel. Well, in our culture, isn't it, isn't, it, isn't it politically incorrect to put pressure on people? Isn't it politically inc incorrect to, to boy, have these religious faith conversations? I mean, wouldn't that be considered rude? It might be rude on earth, but it's appropriate in heaven. Are you more concerned about somebody getting along with you on earth or somebody getting along in heaven one day? Now, he's not saying be rude. He's not saying be nasty. He's not saying be ugly. He's just saying, I want you to make sure you had a conversation. We're more compelled to tell people about where we got our hair done than we are about eternity. Girl, you got to go to this girl. Girl, 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 she good. Girl, she got me in. She got me out. She got it straight. She got it right. She got a good price. <laughs> All right. Let a guy find a golf, a golf, a golf course. You're like, man, it's an incredible golf course. Man, you go over that eighth hole, that ninth hole, you got so and so and so and so, and the food back at the club, it's to die for. All righty. And so watch this now. Do we have those same kind of compelling conversations with people about eternity? So right now I'm real big on this thing called Chat GPT. I mean, I've just fallen in love with this. With this chat GPT, I mean, I mean, I'm about to do workshops and seminars on chat GPT. In fact, this Wednesday, I'm going to do a free webinar. I'm going to do a paid one, too. I'm going to do a free one this Wednesday. I'm going to do a, I got eight kids. I'm going to do a free one. I'm going to do a free one for y'all Wednesday on chat GPT. Some of y'all are afraid of chat GPT, and boy, I'm going to integrate a biblical theology to help you understand chat GPT. I'm, I'm, I'm talking about chat GPT, chat GPT, chat GPT. So my daughter came in the other day, and boy, she does some writing for us at church, right? And I said, well, baby, you using chat GPT? She said, Daddy, I use it sometimes. She gets a degree in English. I said, baby, chat GPT, baby, your English degree. <laughs> I want you to chat GPT. She said, well, well I use it sometimes, but I have to edit. I said, well, sweetie, if you come to my seminar and we learn how to refine stuff at the end, that boy, you won't have to do as much editing. They can put stuff together a month at a time, two months at a time, a year at a time, and ever. So once she left, I, I noticed she wasn't happy with my conversation. I say, baby. Ask my wife. I say, baby, was I, was I rude to her? Was I, was I pushing? She said, no. You just act like if it ain't Chat GPT, it can't be done right. <laughs> and I said, well, that's pretty close to what I'm thinking, honey. That's pretty, I, you, I, I think you got me right there. But you got it right there, right? And so watch this now. I'm, I'm compelled to advertise Chat GPT. I'm convinced about the benefits of Chat GPT. So much so I want to teach other people how to benefit for chat GPT. Chat BGP has changed my life. I'm more productive. Um, I can get stuff done faster because I'm compelled and convicted about the benefits of chat GPT. But there's a problem if I'm more convinced about chat GPT than I'm about the man who created all the GPTs. Do I have that same conviction about the Savior? Do I have that same conviction about Jesus? Am I willing to push and persuade and advertise and promote Jesus with people as much as I do chat GPT? Maybe your thing ain't chat GPT, but substitute your passion, substitute your conviction. I'm doing a free seminar on Wednesday. I'm doing a paid seminar in three weeks. So <laughs> I got eight kids. Go <laughs> And nothing worse than a woman. Um, it's only one thing worse than a non-Christian. It's a non-Christian that's broke. Um, so um, smile at me. All right. Go quickly. I'll be cracking jokes. Go extensively. Go purposefully that his house may be full. God wants as many people. God is not, um, 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 God is not um, something can turn his promise. But God wants as many people as possible to come to heaven, according to Peter. He says, go intensively. Compel them to come. 
And then he says this in verse 24, for I tell you, none of those men who are invited shall taste my banquet. In other words, they won't go to heaven. The people who were invited, they will not go to heaven. Do we care if people go to hell? You know, my wife had a procedure this week, and so we've been in the house. And so if you know, I've had to go out to go to the store to pick up stuff for her or whatever. And I was on the phone one day talking to a friend of mine. And I say, man, ain't no way in the world I want to go to hell. As hot as it is here in Texas, if hell is worse than this, I want no parts of it. You hear me? And I just think, it's people going to hell who are going to face this for an eternity. Imagine facing Texas heat for eternity. Do we care? Do we care? Do we care? We ought to go not, not because it's valuable to them, but because they're valuable to us. So you got to learn how to fr strike up conversations with people who you don't even know. I really am a shy person. If nobody believes me, my wife, I'm not even sure Jesus believes me. But I'm really a shy person. But, but it just happens. I just start these conversations with people. I went to Walmart one of the times. I went out the other day going to pick up some stuff. And this guy, um, he stopped. And he stopped. Because that's what I was, um, I was trying to come out. I was driving my big old F-350. It's got a wide turn. So I was trying to make my turn, but I, I, I couldn't get past the car on the other side of the lane. So, boy, I, I put my truck in reverse, and I was backing up, and, boy, he stopped his car. And so then I, I backed up, and I had enough room to come turn, so I pulled back off in my turn. But, but he was trying to get around me before I knew I didn't see him. I hit his car. And so he got out of his car. I'm like, oh, Lord, he got out of his car. I hope he ain't mad. I'm from Detroit. I ain't playing this. In Jesus' name, I will take it. I, I didn't say, oh, that's just playing. He got out of his car. I said, oh, man. I said, man, I thought you stopped. He said, I thought you saw me. I said, yeah, I did see you. You stopped. And so technically, they don't write tickets in parking lots uh, because the parking lots are private property and they're not governed by the city ordinances. Okay? And so you learn something else there. Man, I learned at church today that you can't get a ticket in the parking lot. What else we preach about? I don't know, but you can't get a ticket in the parking lot, all right? <laughs> so when we said, well, we, we kind of talking civilly. I mean, he was like, am, am. GM. Uh, I tell, I'm a pastor. I don't want to hear all that, all right? So at some point, I said, man, you got insurance? I said, yeah, I got insurance. I said, man, I just got this car fixed the other day. Am, it's going to cost me some more money. Am. <laughs> so I wasn't tripping on that. I'm from Detroit. I heard am before already. <laughs> so I put my head on his shoulder. And I grabbed his hand. And I prayed with him in Jesus' name. A few minutes later, he said, "Am <laughs> well, I kind of got to him already. <laughs> so I guess he didn't hear my prayer. <laughs> but it's not about him. It's about me doing what I'm supposed to do. And so I want to turn every opportunity into an opportunity to invite people to my Savior. Amen. So, Father, we come to you now, Lord Jesus. And God, it's time to go. It's not time to sit. It's not time to wait. It's time to go. So God, I'm not trying to condemn anybody today. I want to encourage people, God, to go out and share what they're beneficiaries of, God. God, my family and I, God, we're prime beneficiaries again of your grace and of your mercy. And God, my heart is just so full, God, to see the benefits of serving you, God, and walking with you and being loved by you, experiencing your grace, God, experiencing your mercy, Lord, experiencing your love, experiencing your empowerment, God, experiencing your promises, God, experiencing your gifts, God. Now, Father, I want other people to experience that as well, Father. So, God, I don't want to see them go to a Christless eternity. I don't want to see them have a Christly time here on earth. I want to see people know you, Father, and the power of your resurrection. So I want to pray, God, that we're compelled to share with others what you have so graciously shared with us. Not because we're mad or because we're angry, but because, God, we want, we want to see the best for people, Lord. 
We want to see them, God, make good decisions. We want them, God, to experience all that we experience in you. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.